Hello everybody, my name is Doug Welker, Marketing Manager for Hartwig, and thank you all very much for attending or watching today's Game Changing Technologies webinar. Today we're talking additive manufacturing, and specifically how it can be a game changer for your shop. So many folks think of the technology behind additive manufacturing or industrial 3D printing, whichever you'd like to call it, as revolutionary. And while it is, the technology is mature. Really, we're at the stage where it's evolutionary, evolutionary for your shop. That's why today we're joined by Hartwood customer Corelink Surgical, where they can discuss their journey into additive and answer some of the questions that you might have if you're thinking about getting involved. We'll also be joined by our partner EOS if you have any technical questions. And on that note, if you have any specific questions, please use that Q&A box below here and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar right after this brief video. Thank you guys very much for watching. All right, guys, we're going to be joined here by Adam and Josh. Greg? Uh, Doug, thanks for the prep here for the uh, EOS event. It's really cool, game changer. Um, so Adam is the Vice President of Operations at CoreLink or SIM Surgical, and Josh is, uh, he helps run the additive department at SIM. And, and it's funny, Adam, uh, you know, I remember almost 20 years ago, one of my first sales calls was on you. Uh, and and now we've been working together again for about 20 years, uh, whether it's additive or on the Sagamis or Okumas or whatever. And I uh, just wanna say thanks for you guys hopping on and sharing your experience about additive and EOS um, and just the story of what you guys have been doing with CoreLink and the, and the number of years that you guys have been in business. Um, Adam, uh, thanks again for hopping on today and doing this for us. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about who CoreLink is and what you guys do and uh, where you are in the industry, and then also what your future looks like uh, with additive, as well as just uh, how this, the, whether it's spinal or neck or whatever you guys have been doing with additive. Well, thanks for having us, Craig. We appreciate being a part of uh, your business and, and this opportunity uh, to share our story on EOS and, and a little bit about our business. So, uh, you know, two companies in our in our business portfolio, one is SIM and one is CoreLink, of which uh, SIM is the exclusive manufacturer for CoreLink products. Uh, CoreLink is a uh, design and uh, developer for spinal fusion products today. We have a full uh, spinal line that will support, you know, trauma, uh, any type of degenerative disc diseases, things of that nature. We have a complete uh, spine line of which we manufacture about 98% of our, our own products. So very vertically integrated. I'll go through just a little bit about our business and how uh, EOS has supported it and how we've uh, developed over the years. So we're a boutique spine company with a brand, a broad portfolio with uh, a lot of different products from 
from Swiss machining, traditional milling, all the way up to additive manufacturing. Uh, you can see some of the products uh, that we manufacture here in-house and some of them that are additive manufactured on the screen here. What makes us unique is we are the manufacturer. We manufacture about 98% of the products that we offer in-house, and we still do contract manufacturing for about 50 other different companies of which some are spine, uh, some are not. So this is uh, the original company that we were founded upon. Uh, it was founded about 50 years ago. We were an eye surgical manufacturer that uh, primarily only did eye surgical instruments uh, of which we manufacture product today for about 50 different companies, some as big as, as this, the uh, companies on the screen here. So we manufacture for, for all those companies. Here's an example of some of the traditional machining that we do. This is a ring handled instrument, just basic milling. This is a, uh, an ankle plate that we do for another company. It's traditional manufactured. And here's a product that we were founded on. Our history, our founders, uh, Kurt and Walt, founded the company in 1968. Again, they both had an ophthalmic um, background, direct German immigrants that uh, came to the United States and worked for the stores company, or which is now Bosch and Lom. They were uh, sponsored to come to the United States and uh, work their debt off to that company, which then they started SIM Surgical. SIM Surgical, um, was then I guess, bought from Kurt and Walt in 2001 by Jay Bartling. Uh, that's Jay there in the picture. Uh, back in the day when he was finishing instruments, he's now our president and CEO uh, for both companies. So for the uh, CoreLink product line, you know, we started really in, in about 2005. So 2001, Jay bought the company. A few years later, invested in an engineer and said, we're making this stuff for everybody else. Why not uh, do it for ourselves? So CoreLink was then founded and launched, of which we started with a peak inner body. So the peak inner body is what you see on the left-hand screen there, and that basically is a is a let's call it a disc replacement or, or a, a, a piece that would go into the discal space to fuse the spine, and that's how it was founded with the peak or polymer plastic. We then started launching other product lines throughout the years. Uh, of which into to 2018, where we started in our 3D printing or additive manufacturing. That additive manufacturing was uh, for those particular products that were once made out of peak. So today we went from a little small shop to a little over 40,000 square feet where we have about 50 plus machines, uh, a little bit over 150 people working every day. Here's a brief image of the, some of the additive manufacturing of which we added a few years back. So this, uh, that's an example of a build plate of a lateral implant that would go into the disc space. It's a picture of our OR lab, our training room, and just some of our employees. We've come a long way from where we were founded. A group shot of our engineering team that uh, working together, collaborative effort. A couple of pictures of our of our 3D printing department. The unique uh, nature of CoreLink's business is we get to see the the products from design all the way through the concept through manufacturing, and then also get to see the surgical surgical procedures happening. So we're, we're able to see a product change, literally change a person's life. That's kind of our story. Um, would you like me to elaborate, Doug? Yeah, sure. I, I'm going to pray, uh, play right here before we do this Q&A, uh, the live Q&A. We've already got some great questions. If you've got questions, please submit them. And it can be really anything related to additive. But let me, uh, I'm gonna play this quick video here, it kind of shows the technology um, and what they're doing here at Coraline. This is really cool stuff.
Corelink developed a patented technology to 3D print titanium alloy implants. Mimetic metal technology creates the optimal balance of a lattice scaffolding and inner trabecular structure to emulate bone. It features a unique 100% open pore design to reduce stress and provide directional strength and strain. Hydrophilic wicking is designed to promote blood flow. Minimized device density enhances post-operative imaging, and the strength of titanium is leveraged to allow for a larger graph volume. The first step is the use of CAD design software to engineer a 3D model. Structural analysis is completed on the CAD design to simulate how the implant would react under various loads. This is a cross-sectional result of the simulations. The colors correlate to strain values, which is essentially a measurement of distortion. As we know from Wolf's Law, bone is a self-optimizing structure that adapts to its environment and needs to experience a certain degree of strain to achieve a stable fusion. Testing continues with the plastic 3D printed prototype. The design is refined through a loop of CAD design and testing until the optimal construct is achieved. Next, our 3D technician creates a build plate for our 3D printers. Titanium powder is transformed by laser welding micro fine layers one by one until the final implant is created. Implants are then removed from the build plate for final finishing. Master technicians deburr the implants using a rotary tool. Our proprietary secondary finishing steps provide a uniform, roughened surface finish that is ideal for implant bone interfacing. Prior to delivery, our implants are sterilized. Corelink's additively manufactured implants created with magnetic metal technology provide the ideal balance of porosity and strength. Go to corelinksurgical.com to learn more. All right, guys, we'll start the Q&A here. If everybody could turn on the uh, turn on their cameras. And hey, Fabian from uh, EOS has joined us too here. He's on. We got Josh and Adam from SIM from uh, Core, or Core Link. Greg Hartwig, he's going to be handling the Q&A here too. So, um, Greg, you want to kick it off here? It looks like we do have a lot of questions that are coming in. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, we're good. All right. Great, great. Yeah, there's a lot of questions here. Uh, a lot of good questions. Um, so this has been good, good start. Um, so one of the first questions is, uh, Adam or Josh, what caused uh, Corelink to consider additive for your shop? Sure, I'll answer. So um, spinal implant market had, had, had been kind of changed by a, an industry leader um back about four or five years ago where peak which was the traditional implant material uh they had they had started on a 3d printed uh inner body so us being a let's call us a smaller spine company but a, a quick follower our ceo wanted to venture into the additive manufacturing for inner body products of which basically we started off by taking our current product line and just kind of changing the material to an additive manufacturing. Yeah. On top of all that, the material choice originally was peak. It is extremely expensive given that it has to be very, a lot controlled and approved by the FDA. It, it causes a, the, the raw material cost to be excessive. All right, so there's a couple more here um, that we've got. Yeah, there's there's quite a few. <laughs> it's, it's actually really good. It's, it's uh, I'm impressed with the amount of questions we have. Um, so you know these these additive machines in general from EOS or anybody else, they're not inexpensive. They are they're they're high end capital equipment machines. Um, what kind of ROI have you guys seen from your additive machines for the work that you guys have been doing? Uh, so good question. Um, you know, for us, the, the ROI wasn't the main driver. Um, it was a very, I'm going to call it a short, less than a year ROI for us. Um, 
However, it took a, a while for us to validate the processes. Um, I will say this was a new process for us. We hired Josh, uh, so, so kind of you know, reaching out for, for what we did is we said, we're gonna make an investment in an additive piece of equipment, and then we're going to reach out for an expert to implement this into our shop, which was Josh Arnone. Um, so for us, it was about taking the process and understanding it, hiring the people, validating the process. So for us, it's a heavy uh, validation cycle because of the FDA restrictions. This was a new product to the market. Um, so it, it required a lot of hurdles through the FDA, but not so much um, that we couldn't conquer. But as far as an ROI, it was less than a year for us. And that's a, that's a heck of an investment. I mean, you can't really find that anywhere. Congrats on that. That's great. And uh, Josh, you've got, uh, what's that, the University of Missouri uh, behind you, your uh, diploma there? Yeah, um, that's that's actually my wife's diploma. She's the, uh, okay. the smart one in the family. <laughs> but, uh, I stole her seat. I've got two kids running around in this house, so I've got to find a place to for a little bit of peace and quiet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I spent a good 10 years at Mizzou, um, seven with my undergrad, then three with a PhD, and then spent a couple more years uh, in a postdoc program. But, um, you know, I, it's funny because, you know, Adam mentions me being an expert in all, and all. And honestly, really, the only thing I'm an expert in is just being a student. And, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a little bit of experience in 3D printing coming into this. Um, but, uh, um, you know, really was kind of in over my head, uh, which is really where I like to be, you know. Um, it was a a situation where you know unbox this machine figure out how it works and design some implants uh that really takes advantage of you know what this machine provides for us and uh you know i was like a kid in a candy store um loved every minute of it um so i you know i had a chance to spend a good three or four months just kind of you know turning knobs and figure out how things affected you know various material properties and and really just learning what i didn't know um, and at that point, uh, we reached out to some experts uh, at EOS um, and basically, you know, now, now we had learned enough about the machine that we kind of had an idea of, you know, what all we still had left to learn. And so, you know, we brought in uh, Michael Galba uh, from EOS and, you know, I, I called him my master sensei because he, <laughs> he, uh, he really took me to school. I mean, um, he taught me more than what I had intended on learning during that time, uh, things that I still use today. And, uh, you know, I'm still in contact with those guys at least, you know, once every three months, um, just picking their brains and they're bouncing ideas off me and, and I them. And, and so it's, uh, at no point have I, have I got to a point where I can say, yeah, I've got this whole thing figured out. Um, it's just, there's just so much new to learn. And, uh, I feel like we've, we've barely scratched the surface here. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. So, uh, Fabian, would you mind giving us a, a couple of minutes on additive mines and what your folks do there? Because what Josh is talking about, you know, there's a lot of folks I would imagine on the line here. They're like just wondering, are their their applications? Do they make sense for additive? Uh, do they not? And with additive mines at EOS, it's a group of a bunch of folks that are really the experts in additive. Yeah, but, sure. uh, Fabian, would you explain a little bit about what you guys do and what you bring to the market? Yeah, sure. Uh, would love to. Um, so, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Fabian. Uh, I'm part of a, of a group within EOS that we call Additive Minds. And Additive Minds, in the end, was, was started five years ago um, around the idea of taking all of the expertise and knowledge that we have within EOS and patch packaging all of that knowledge in a way that it's easy adaptable by, by our customers. So um, since then, uh, the Editive Minds Group has, has grown a lot from you know, those early folks with uh, Michael Galba that you just uh, mentioned, Josh, uh, and uh, some some others from, from seven people to now a global team of more than 100 engineers and consultants that really take companies from you know, an early stage of trying to understand how to adopt additive manufacturing all the way into production. And um, I think that is 
not only important for EOS, but important for the whole additive manufacturing industry. Uh, we do believe uh, strongly that one of the core barriers for additive manufacturing uh, to, to be adopted even further in the industry is, is expertise and knowledge in the market. So therefore, as you mentioned, Greg, we have programs to help companies identify those first parts and applications that have a positive uh, return of investment, but also a positive impact on their technology, where you know we look at parts from a technological feasibility and an economic feasibility. They may have experts on the design side who work hand in hand with uh, the designers on uh, on, on our customer side to really a show them all the possibilities and, and what's possible and as you mentioned Josh tips and tricks that they can adopt in their in their daily 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 lives in order to really leverage additive manufacturing and, and look at additive manufacturing as really as the innovative and and impactful technology that it can be right going away from just substituting and moving more towards innovating and, and pushing the limits of, of additive manufacturing systems. Mm -hmm. And then also very importantly, and I'm sure Josh, you had to touch point to that as well on the qualification side, how do we qualify uh, our uh, our machine park? How do we run a machine capability now in additive manufacturing? And last but not least, even the experts on the, you know, integration IoT uh, side where uh, some of, some of uh, uh, the, the folks are already at with conventional manufacturing, but wonder how to integrate additive manufacturing systems into those environments. Yeah, that's great, Fabian. Thank you. And I would I would ask, or I actually mention that anybody here on the line, uh, if you're interested in having EOS, come take a look at your applications. We're we're all in. Uh, that's part of the the deal today. Is we we want to dig a little bit deeper with you to look at your applications and see if there's a fit for you. Whether it's Palmer or metal, it doesn't matter. We're just uh, we're very intrigued with this technology. We love it, and we believe it's the future for our business and and probably for yours too, quite honestly. So um, we would like the opportunity to take a look at uh, your application if there's an opportunity there. <clears throat> so um, let's see here. Another question. Uh, this is a <laughs> this is a this could be a troublesome question, but I think it'd be a good one. Um, what's your experience been with EOS, Adam or uh, John? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start off, and I I. I our experience with EOS has been fantastic. Um, you know, we've had a, a number of, we've had experience with a number of different machine tool suppliers and machines over the years um, from the tra tra traditional machining. Um, the support level has been fantastic. Machine reliability has been fantastic. Um, the capability of it is, I'm going to say industry leading. We are also in a position where we can compare it to another additive manufacturing machine. We have two different brands on our shop floor. And I would say that the EOS is superior to uh, the, the other machine tools that we have. Josh, maybe you want to elaborate? Yeah, um, you know, and Adam is not the only one that, that thinks that, you know, I, I work really closely with the, uh, the guys on the floor that, that use these machines and every one of them has complained about the the other machine, um, and has nothing good, uh, nothing but good things to say about the EOS machine. Um, you know, I, I did talk a little bit about you know the the guys that I work with um, at Additive Minds. You know, obviously all good things there, um, but also the technicians. You know, that come in every six months to um, you know keep our machine going. Uh, every one of those guys has just been fantastic to work with. Um, Easy to talk to, very knowledgeable, um, and uh, just a pleasant uh, face to have in our shop. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, of a bad experience or a somewhat negative experience to kind of balance this so you don't think I'm, you know, uh, you know, selling these guys. But uh, honestly, of, of all the groups that I've worked with on a professional level, um, EOS is, is one of the top uh, companies that I've, I've worked with personally. Uh, really enjoy them. Yeah, same here. That's great to hear. And this isn't this is not a sales pitch, but there was a question that came across, and so we figured we'd just go ahead and address it. But yeah. thank you guys for the the just being candid here. Uh, another question that came across: um, Does EOS make any special machines? Kind of like uh, <clears throat> I would 
I would imagine like the 4K machine or whatever you guys would, might want to mention that, but there are there is a a branch inside of EOS that does make special machines. I would ask Fabian, do you mind just mentioning a little bit about uh, what you guys do on the special side? Sure. So uh, about three years ago, we started a sister company out of EOS called AMSTM, uh, Advanced Manufacturing Custom Machinery. And uh, in the end, what that organization does, it takes the uh, EOS mainframes that we've developed and customizes these for a certain application uh, specific uh, use case. So uh, what Greg just mentioned is the M4K, which is uh, actually the largest uh, DMLS printer in the world. It has a one meter Z height, uh, which is used for, uh, for the uh, space industry, especially when we look at uh, certain um, uh, combustion chambers in the space industry. Uh, then there is a uh, machine such as a dual uh, laser M290 with a fine detail resolution, which is starting to uh, have a lot of interest in the medical field for very high detail resolution uh, applications. Uh, but then there's also others with uh, just a enlarged X and Y uh, frame up to 450 millimeters. Uh, and um, yeah, as I said, uh, all of these machines are custom, but uh, we do, of course, uh, work very closely together with AMCM to a ensure that uh, the uh, machines have the same quality requirements as U.S. machines. But also, once the market demand increases for a M4K, as an example, the one meter machine, those that get then pulled into the U.S. organization and become your own machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing to elaborate on is your is your uh, different material types too. That that is uh, unique to EOS. They're offering a few different material types that that I haven't seen in a few of the other additive machines. Yeah, there is a question I can I can see here, Greg. If you want me to address it, how many types of materials does EOS offer in powder form? So uh, EOS itself, uh, we have different uh, maturities of of material. Uh, there is the, uh, the, the the very mature materials that uh, have uh, uh, many, many data points and have many years of development uh, behind them. And those we do sell also with uh, defined process parameters uh, to ensure our customers that they can reach the uh, data specifications for material specifications that we outline in our material data sheets. Uh, but we also do have uh, uh, materials that are in a bit of a lower tier level for uh, new markets and for organizations that want to uh, want to develop very application specific uh, process parameters. So overall, we have about 30 materials in our standard portfolio. Um, everything from uh, uh, stainless steels to tool steels to uh, ink canals, uh, 718 to 939, uh, but also, uh, of course, the, uh, the standards uh, in, in titanium and uh, aluminum, uh, copper and uh, copper chromium uh, alloys. But uh, I think also very interesting need to mention is that EOS is not a lock-in uh, ecosystem. You are able to print uh, third-party materials uh, on EOS systems. Um, of course, uh, there is then uh, a certain lower amount of support that we can uh, that we can uh, provide based on the fact that we don't have previous data points uh, to share on uh, on third party materials but we do uh, on a very regular basis work with uh, third party materials such as the startups uh, the elementum 3ds that develop very interesting uh, new uh, new uh, alloys and materials for our printers mm -hmm. yeah that's good yeah, so this is interesting. Uh, most everybody's on. In fact, we have more people on now with the Q&A than we did before. So that's a good thing. Um, I would ask uh, maybe one more question, then we'll hop off the line. But on an average day or, or an average week, Josh or, or Adam, what is how often are these printers actually printing parts for you guys? Is it a, you know an eight or two hour thing or is it a 24 hour thing? Or how often are they actually running and, and making parts for you? Um, every day. Short answer is every day. There, so we, we have kind of um, honed into a production strategy today where we have two different EOS M290s, uh, both tie machines. Um, we, we've strategized where we do a 24-hour build in one, a 48-hour build in the other to avoid 
you know, both of them switching over on the same day. Um, so we build the builds accordingly, but it's running as much of the 24 hours as we possibly can. We're, we're timing the switchovers to where they're during the day where we, where we staff it um, and, and then build the builds. And through the weekend, we try and put our taller, longer builds. So we're getting the most out of the, the long uh, unattended weekend time. But you know, a, a typical week for us looks like about 120 hours of build time per machine. That's amazing. Uh, I don't think there's <laughs> any other machine tool that can actually do that. That's uh, that's impressive. Congrats to you guys. That's great. It really is amazing because you know we we, we were born out of you know traditional machining and and we're not a production environment by any means. Even when you start building these spinal implants, they're you know we're not building the same thing every day. We're you know when we launch a kit, it's got a hundred hundred different SKUs of implants in there. Um, so it's not like we're running thousands and thousands of the same part every day. It's a different part every day, every build. Um, as a matter of fact, most of our builds have on average about six different lots per build, meaning six different SKUs per build. Uh, so it's a lot of different parts. A lot of programming goes into it. Uh, a lot of activity goes into keeping those machines running. But at the end of the day, to get you know a couple of, of folks' efforts uh, in programming and doing switchovers to get 120 hours a week staffed one shift is amazing. Um, our traditional machining to get that kind of time uptime, um, meaning run time, you know, we'd have to have four shifts and we'd have to have it staffed uh, seven days a week, basically 24 hours a day to get that type of activity, even on even if we're running full blown production. If I could step in here, Greg and, and Adam. In talking about those other machines here, you know, what do you have in, in the shop there? Like the additive is, you know, with your other machines, does it assist with your other production work? Are you having the other machines do some of the finishing? Can you explain a little bit just about kind of your shop environment that goes along with the additive stuff that you have? Uh, sure. So, you know, we're, we're born out of just traditional manufacturing. So, you know, I've got 40 different machine tools, not including the, the additive, uh, of which are traditional machining, Swiss machining, lathes five axis mills. Um, so the, the products that we're printing today are unique to the 3D printers as we couldn't manufacture those in traditional, traditional manufacturing methods. As you saw in the video earlier, there's a lot of porosity and, and what we call lattice, uh, which, which is a, let's call it a hollow structure, but still has strength. Um, and some of that was directly driven from Josh. It was developed to mimic the technology, uh, mimic bone um, and the elasticity of bone. Um, so anyway, with the, 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 the titanium printers today basically support our implants that we offer. All the rest of our equipment supports uh, both, mostly the instruments. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and also just to piggyback off what Adam was saying, the implants that come off of our uh, 3D printer, um, most of those don't go into any secondary machining. I mean, we, we have some, some hand finishing um, and some, some surface uh, modifications that we do, but as far as going from a 3D printer to, you know, a five axis or, or a, a lathe, um, we've, we've designed that out of our process. So uh, even, even to the point where, you know, the, the implants that are coming out of our, our machine, we're not using wire EDMs to cut them off. We're not using blades to cut them off. Uh, we're using technicians on the floor with, with hand tools to, to, to break, essentially break these off um, with very little uh, uh, residual supports left on the implant, uh, which means very little secondary, you know, hand finishing with a rotary tool. Uh, that's right. And that's the art of, you know, designing for AM, right? You don't only design for the AF manufacturing process, you also design for the secondary operations to keep those to a minimum. And therefore, A, of course, uh, reduce cost on the overall part, but B, of course, also, you know, reduce your uh, risk of any um, thing, anything going wrong in post-processing. That's right. 
And so for us, the post-processing also introduces other opportunities for, for the part to get dirty, uh, introducing coolant to the part, and that's a whole nother risk level for a medical device. Uh, but we we pushed our, the engineering team to designing and and adjusting their models and their thought process to printing the parts complete. I mean, even down to the threads, we are printing threads today. So it's it's pretty impressive what we what we've done and what the machine's capable of too. Oh, that's that's awesome, guys! Thank you. Hey, I think uh, we're we're getting we're, we're running a little tight on time. Uh, I think we're in good shape here, but. For one, I just want to say thank you. And then for those on the line, if you're interested in learning more or want us to check out your applications, just respond to the email that you got from Hartwig and we're more than happy to uh, reach out to you guys and, and check in with you to, to look at your application and see if it's a good fit. But in general, I just want to say thanks guys. This has been a great game changer. Hopefully uh, those on the line can see the game changing technology that EOS is bringing to the table and it's worked out very well for, for CoreLink and SIM. Um, and for Adam and Josh, thanks guys. I mean, you guys didn't have to do this, but we re really appreciate you doing this and uh, Fabian as well. Thank you all very much. Um, just want to say thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having us. You got it. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.